Good afternoon, Cherries fans, and welcome to this very, very happy Friday. Of course, it's a very, very happy Friday because we beat Southampton uh, yesterday at St Mary's. Fantastic result, fantastic performance. We will be doing a free-for-all show later on. Make sure that you go and get involved at 8 o'clock this evening. But we do have another game to focus on, and that game is happening on Sunday. Our opponents are another team who are in the relegation battle, Leeds United. Now, before I do welcome on my special guest, here's a little bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. To find out what they can do for you, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. Now, of course, our opponents, Leeds United, on Sunday at 2 o'clock, have got 30 points from 33 games. They are just above the relegation zone and therefore are in desperate need of the points. They do have some tough games after this. So this is a six-pointer for them. Is it a six-pointer for us? Not so sure anymore. Of course, we was involved in a thriller up at Elland Road earlier on in the season. A 4-3 defeat in which we were 3-1 up. And, of course, we come out with the tagline, teams like Leeds. Well, Leeds, a lot bigger club than Bournemouth. But at the same time, they are down there in the mix. Are we safe? We'll find out. It is a pleasure, though, to welcome back onto the show the leading Leeds podcast the square ball and from the square ball dan moylan welcome back dan how are you doing mate pleasure to be here thank you for having me back i'm not too bad not too bad well the season could be better but you know let's get to that yes yes most definitely and of course we had a fantastic result last night against southampton um we're smiling from ear to ear doing that over our local rivals of course now we look like we are safe so on 36 points. And OK, it can st- we can still mathematically get pulled back into it. Do you think that there is more pressure on Leeds to get a result against Bournemouth? Or do you think it would be easier or harder considering we've probably not as got as much to play for? It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think in terms of the result last night, we were, we were chatting about it on our show, about what we wanted. And there was an argument for, like, does Southampton winning drag Bournemouth back into it or do we want Southampton cut adrift would a draw be the best result and I think in the end we resolved just to see what happened and 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 deal with the with the outcome speaking personally I don't mind Southampton being being cut adrift I suspect they're gone now I think it's too much to ask for um and so the sooner we can get as many teams cut adrift and us not be one of them then absolutely fine and quite frankly you you lot are uh, miles better than than Southampton I think who've been uh been pretty poor this season, but we've we've not been a right lot better, unfortunately. Of course, we are one of the last five games for Leeds. And just looking at the remaining fixtures, you got Man City away, um, Newcastle at home, West Ham away, and Tottenham at home. This is a must win. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is the we were saying on our show that we did yesterday. This is like the lowest placed team that we're facing in the running. So you know, just league table alone suggests it's the best opportunity uh, for points. And and as to whether it changes kind of the approach to it, I don't think it does. We we needed to come down there. We need to come down there and win, regardless. I mean, a, a draw doesn't completely finish it by any stretch of the imagination. But as you say, with the fixtures coming up, like the Man City Newcastle, going to be really really tough. West Ham. After that, we've got away who are coming off the back of, I think it's seventh game in 21 days. They'll be straight off the back of the European semi-final um, just before we play them. Maybe there's an opportunity for something there, but given how, how porous we've been, I, there's just not a lot of confidence with with Leeds at the minute. And then final game of the season actually might represent a good opportunity. Spurs at home to get something because you would hope Spurs being Spursy, they might be on the beach by then. So I don't think it, it's not all on tonight, uh, tonight, this weekend rather, sorry. Um, yeah. But we would do ourselves a huge amount of, of um, good fortune by by beating you, I think, yeah. The last time we spoke, of course, Jesse Marsh was in charge of Leeds. And Javi Garcia is now in the hot seat, of course, formerly through the revolving door of Watford. Um, what have you made of what he's done? Because it seems from... 10 games he's got 11 points do you think that's a decent return or do you think are you still undecided about him uh he started well um i think we we saw a noticeable difference based on what we saw with jesse marsh who um so you, you could say i guess um grassy has been played a little bit of a hospital pass having to pick up the pieces of that um we were good up to a certain point. I mean, you'll be you'll be aware we lost, you know, six one to Liverpool. Prior to that, we lost five one at home to Palace. The stupid yeah. thing is, we should have beaten Palace. Uh, we were m- much, much, much the better side in the in the first half. We conceded an equaliser just a minute or two before half time, and then absolutely collapsed. And there seems to have been no way back from that point since. Prior to that point and up to that, it was kind of it was kind of steady away with Gracia. You saw what he was trying to do. It was unspectacular. It's mostly four four two out of possession. Um, trying to stay solid, not committing as many men forward. But then suddenly we found that we've had games that have, have come up since. We played Leicester at home and we drew that one 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 having led for quite a long time. But there's a lot of fear um, in the way that Leeds are playing at the minute. Like they didn't try and go out and win that Leicester game. They sat back and sat back and deeper and deeper and deeper, kept inviting Leicester on. And, and Gracia, to answer the question specifically about him, was very very passive with his subs and um, making changes. Like he had a, he had a substitution window left to to use um, in that game late against Leicester, and he, and he seemed almost paralysed by um, not knowing what to do. So it's been a mixed bag. What I, I would say is, I think he's probably not the man to to stay on next year. I don't think the fans will go for such unadventurous football, and it feels like we've kind of, we've kind of broken him already but admittedly it's from it's from a difficult position because anybody coming in like in february or or thereafter is it's it's difficult isn't it um yeah. making changes that late in the season let's look at those palace and liverpool defeats because of course you were at home for both of those games and 11 goals all right we're not ones to speak after our 9-0 <laughs> thrashing at the field but um 11 goals in two games um, doesn't look good. Is there a problem with the defence? Yes. <laughs> to answer it in one word. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there, yes, there is a problem with the defence. To be honest, the Leeds problems kind of go back further than that in the sense that we had Bielsa and we can we can chat about Bielsa if you, if you like as well because he yeah, nearly ended up um, in, in Bournemouth. But So we've gone from Bielsa who was all about controlling possession and um, playing front foot football. Um, then we switched over to Jesse Marsh who was also about front foot football but it was all very kind of playground kick and rush, like the it was almost the crudest um, form of the Red Bull football. So you basically sacrifice possession in order to try and win it um, yeah. high up um, the pitch. So we went from this possession football to this getting rid of possession football, which I think the squad wasn't necessarily suited to. And the Red Bull football, um, it was all very narrow, playing with inverted wingers or whatever, or almost tucking people inside. You know, there was flirtations with four two 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 and things like that. And it just didn't work. So that we've gone from possession to non-possession, um, but adventurous football. To then we've gone to this um, football with Gracia, where he's asking the players to be more structured and defensive and not commit as many men forward and not do the pressing. It's a, We're sitting in much more of what, what I think the cool kids call 
a low block. So we've had this weird um, slaloming through different footballing identities. And the one thing that's not changed throughout all this um, has been the defence. They've not improved the defence in in a couple of years. Um, and you'll know we came we came up off the back of the pandemic in, in 2020, signed defenders in that window. Um, but we haven't recruited anybody since. And we had one of the worst, worst if not the worst, def- uh, defences in the Premier League last season. So it seems to be like there's a, a real issue with recruitment. And you might be aware as well, in the January window, we signed, George, we signed Jorginho Ruta um, from Hoffenheim, yeah. who is 20 years old. He's He was ostensibly sold to us as a striker. He's not really a striker. He's more like a, I don't know, like an inside forward, more of a second striker, maybe somebody who could play slightly wider. And um, what we were crying out for was defensive reinforcements. But unfortunately, we have a director of football who has fallen out of favour, Victor Orta, um, with his recruitment. The money he's spent hasn't necessarily been wise or, or well-targeted. So what you're seeing at the minute with Leeds and the problems with the defence, it kind of goes back almost to the summer after we got promoted in the first season in the Premier League when we finished ninth. They opted to do two years of recruitment in one um, after we got promoted. So we kind of stood still for the second year, which was last year, and suffered tremendously as a result. And they still didn't really address the underlying weaknesses with the squad. And we maybe, and you'll understand this as well, um, having moved up and down the divisions a couple of times, um, trying to get a foothold in the Premier League with players who've played for you in the Championship. It's not easy, is it? No, no, most definitely. And I think if we hadn't have spent what we did in January, I think we would be right in the mix, if not where Southampton are. Yeah. So the additions have been very, very good. Um, and of course, Neto has been unbelievable. Seeing as you mentioned him, uh, let's talk about Marcelo Bielsa, because like you say, we were heavily linked with him. There was, I did actually speak to an Argentinian journalist and he said that it was pretty much a done thing. And a lot of Bournemouth fans were all for Bielsa coming in. Do you think Bielsa would have done better considering what Gary O'Neill has done now? It's impossible to know, isn't it? It's almost the same as the question of like when Bielsa got sacked at Leeds last season, we had 12 games left to go and there were those ongoing arguments. Would he have kept us up? Would he have taken us down? And it's just completely unprovable either way. So I don't know. I feel like it's almost the same question as that. What I know is you would have had you've had a, you would have had a brilliant adventure, and you would have experienced yeah. something that probably and it's it sounds like I'm being theatrical when I say it, but Leeds fans love Bielsa because he he transcended football because he's such a purist, possibly even to a fault um, with with his style of football. But God, it's good to watch. It was such good football to watch. It's so exciting. Like I said before, it's possession based. It's front foot, a little bit like um, how Brighton play. Um, yeah. At times, you're talking about trying to replicate what like Man City do, for example, um, but with players who should in no way be attempted to play that sort of football. You know, the Premier League's kind of, it's kind of plagued with teams yeah. playing on the counter-attack and playing like a low block, a deep defence and stuff like that. And he just kind of came in and was just the, the, the counterpoint to all that. And as a character as well, such an interesting, like enigmatic character um, who you just wanted to sit and listen to. In, in press conferences. And I think, I think when we spoke last time about this, um, when I was on the show um, last time, I was saying like in, in Chile, they call um, the, the Chile fans because he was the national team boss there, the yeah. widows of Bielsa. And now um, like 14 months on from when he left Leeds, I completely understand that you kind of, you just, you miss the man, you miss the football, particularly in, in Leeds case with what's followed. So yeah, you would, you would have loved it. I have to admit, I'm glad he didn't go to, to Bournemouth. Um, it it would have felt like, seeing your ex shacking up with the bloke down the road. You know what I mean? Like just <laughs> yeah. I kinda I kinda want to keep it keep him for hours. But and do you know what, to be fair, given the way that like last night went and the season's going for you, I think you've probably you've done all right regardless. So um happy endings all round, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Well, we might as well mention as well our earlier game in the season <laughs> and what an eventful one. Uh, we spoke briefly afterwards as well, didn't we? Um on Twitter. But it was, and we was actually part of um, the Hound of the Somervilles um, podcast as well that you did. Um, ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. And what you do, guys, is fantastic. But one thing that one of us did come out with was teams like Leeds. Um, <laughs> should be beating teams like Leeds. We, 
do you think that's justified now or do you think that still let's be honest Leeds are a much bigger club than Bournemouth yeah but you know you, you can only you can only deal with what's in front of you can't you and um yeah I think like I said it reflected on that game earlier in the season I still don't know what to make of it because what happened around that time basically saved Jesse Marsh's job yeah. I have had it on fairly good authority that um heading into that world because you were the last were you the last game that we played before the world cup we, we played spurs away just after that but you were the last home game we had before the world cup um yeah bonfire night wasn't it so yes. we ca- we came into that game um off the back of four defeats we lost to palace arsenal mm-hmm. leicester and fulham at home and we were terrible and everyone was saying marsh was going to get fired and we went to anfield and won in the last minute um Two one in a game that we probably should have lost as well, and quite frankly, we should have lost to you um, at Ellen Road the way that that one went. And those two games saved Marsh's job, to all intents and purposes. And they they sacked him far too late, um, with you know speaking with the aid of hindsight. Um, so there's kind of mixed feelings about it, I guess. In that if we'd have made a change heading into the World Cup, we probably wouldn't find ourselves in the the perilous state that we're in at the minute. As for the game itself. It was just one of those crazy days, wasn't it? You know, an inexplicable day of football. I'm just looking at the goals now, and I'd, I'd almost forgotten the the order of scoring and the fact that we went one 0 up so early with that with that penalty, wasn't it? And yeah. I think given where you were at that time, um, and we were thinking, oh, this is a game we can win, we can get back on track here, and mm-hmm. you think, oh, we've scored early, that'll settle the nerves. We should like run on and and you know maybe get a few here, and we did get a few, but not in the way that we expected because you yeah you were two one up then inside twenty minutes. And it took a long old while for us to to get back into it, especially as it was 3-1. Um, yeah, what a stupid day. What a stupid day it was, yeah. You should have beaten us. It was crazy. And to be fair, one thing that I think that Gary O'Neill did that day was when we were 3-1 up, he defended too deep. And that's something he's abandoned since. Um, when teams do that, do you feel that Leeds do get the better of them? It's hard to know, isn't it? Because we've had so many different styles of football. Like particularly, we had two very contrasting styles over the over the course of this season. Um, we have we've done all right generally against the the lower sides in the division at times. But then again, we came up against Palace and they thumped us, and it feels like somebody's flicked a switch, and we've just been undone by the idea of like Palace sit deep, for example, and then they just hit us on the counter with quick players. If you do that to us, you could murder us, but. It's just knowing which which leads are going to turn up. It really is. It's it's impossible to know at the minute. Like if you ask me to forecast this game, which you may well do, I I genuinely have no idea which way it's going to go. The like the form table would suggest that you're going to beat us. Um, it could could be a draw just to string this whole thing out another week, uh, or we could win because we desperately need a win. I just I have have no idea, and I don't know which leads is going to turn up. Um, what I do know is that hitting us on the break on the counter causes us like big problems. So. It's potentially an avenue for for Bournemouth to to profit, but um, I did say a few. Like, I see a few um, comments last night talking about Bournemouth's style of play, and it, it's is it relatively slow or is it quick? Because uh, I don't really know enough about Bournemouth this season to to have an informed opinion. To be honest, it's sped up. It's right. sped up since earlier on in the season under Gary O'Neill. Of course, under Scott Parker, it was incredibly slow, very very defensive. That's how we got thrashed so yeah. heavily at Liverpool because we just sat there sat back and Liverpool picked us off at ease. Um, Sounds it's familiar. It's a lot quicker now. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Scott Parker uh, mentality. Just sit back, you know, defend a lead, which we did, you know, in the championship we did and we blew those. But against Liverpool, we shouldn't have been defending, you know, from the get-go. Against Arsenal... 2-0 down in the first 10 minutes. Liverpool, 2-0 down in the first six minutes. Gary O'Neill has moved away from that. And I think when we did play Leeds last, and of course the week before, we was 2-0 up against Spurs, got beat 3-2 by them as well. I think things have moved on since then. So I think he's he's learned as a manager. It, it seems like you're kind of playing with more intent. Yeah, like I watched the the closing minutes of the Spurs away game that, that you yeah. won obviously was cursing as you, as you got your, your late winner, but obviously great, you know, great for you lot. Yeah. And it, it just, it strikes me as a lesson that maybe Leeds need to learn this season is that we've been far too passive, particularly under Gracia. Like I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we go down there and get our noses in front, if we then sit back and try and defend it again, because that seems to have been 
what's happened under Gracia. Um, and I think we've, apart from Leicester, we've lost the most points from winning positions this season. So mm-hmm. all that stuff that you're saying about what Parker was doing and how it started maybe under Gary O'Neill, it's it's all very familiar. Probably tells a story about why teams are down at the bottom end of the league, doesn't it, really? Yeah. And I don't think that approach really works in the Premier League. No. You've got to go out there and cause, cause problems for uh, for other teams in my eyes if you just sit back you, you are just waiting as you say to be picked off and that's exactly what happened with us when we played Liverpool at home we were good for about half an hour and contained them but they never got out of second gear and then they just carried on passing it around until they got an opening or we made a mistake because we make mistakes because we're rubbish yeah well that's what Eddie always used to do with us we'll just score one more than you we used to concede quite a lot of goals under Eddie and of course now he's got the money that Newcastle have got that's why he's having so much success, I feel. Um, and, of course, he uh, demolished Everton. Believe it or not, he's an Everton fan, Eddie Howe. <laughs> so um, he always has quite a good record against them. But looking at the Leeds team, of course, you did sign a player that was mildly linked to Bournemouth, um, mainly because of the American connection, uh, Weston McKenney. Um, what's he been like? <laughs> he's been... Um, what's the nicest way of putting this? He's not been great, but he's getting there. So uh, for anybody who's not familiar or operating in Leeds Twitter circles, there seems to be, there's a lot of kind of USMNT noise that, that follows the American players around. Yeah. And they seem to attract um, hangers on is probably the, <laughs> the nicest way of putting it. And there's one in particular who has been very vocal, who we interacted with around McKenney's arrival. Um, he did a Twitter space. He held a Twitter space um, yeah. this week in which he was trashing some of the other players and it, trying to make it clear that he wasn't uh, he wasn't speaking on behalf of Weston McKenney, um, but was also saying he was instrumental in various moves. And, and McKenney's had to kind of pour some cold water on this this week on his own. It's all just very tiresome and, and social media. Do you know what I mean? But there's yeah. there's just been a lot of noise which hasn't been been helpful um, because McKenney's performances haven't been great. He's shown some real like you can see that the Champions League quality in terms of um, passing ability, uh, he's got little moments of vision, neat passes that that come about. But th- there is a sense that he's not worked hard enough. Um, people are saying he doesn't look fit enough either because he looks like he looks like a big lad. He's a big lad for a footballer, and there are reports of um, of his diet maybe not being great when he was at, at Juventus. Too much of the pasta and stuff. So it's not been a happy hunting ground for him so far. But the game against Leicester was far far better off the back of some fairly justified criticism. So. I think we're on the hook for something like 30, 35 million for him. Um, if we stay up, it was 10. I think we've got to get 10 appearances and those stay up. And um, I think we're obligated to sign him, although there is some doubt about that. But that's a Leeds problem. You know, we'll we'll deal with that in due course. Let's stay up first. Uh, and a lot of people are saying it'd be money badly spent, particularly when you look at the the weakness of our defence. So it's it's kind of a, it's a watch this, watch this space, I think. But it, it, we've got to remember it's coming to a side that's been struggling. We've been terrible, particularly in the second half of this season um, for the most part. So you do wonder how well a player can play. But he's got those, he's got those touches of quality. Um, but it just needs to... I think that with, where leads are concerned, and you might notice this from the game on Sunday, is that everything just seems so stressed. Uh, like the passing's yes. off, all that kind of thing. You know, it's, you can tell it's a team that's playing with like really high stress levels. They're not happy at the minute. Mind you, we're not either. One player that has been rumoured to be leaving Leeds at the end of the season is Rodrigo. And, of course, he scored 13 goals in 30 games. What have you made of his performances so far this season? Is he leading the line, or do you feel that he could have got a lot more? Well, he's another one who's kind of enigmatic. This season, he's been good. Uh, He was injured for a spell. He's been injured on and off pretty much the whole two and a half, three years he's been here. Because we, he was our record signing when we when we brought him in um, yeah. post promotion, twenty seven million. And again, this this goes back to the issue of recruitment and, and Victor Orta's role in bringing players in and who did Bielsa sign off on and who didn't he? So you brought Rodrigo in, who um, seems to be a good centre forward. He's often been deployed in like a, as a second striker or as a number ten. Doesn't really suit his game. Sometimes he's too ponderous. Doesn't have the athleticism to play in a pressing team, in my opinion. Not consistently. Although he was running around like a, a madman on. Tuesday against um against Leicester. Uh so he's he's been kind of exposed by being in a system that doesn't suit him in Bielsa's football and then possibly to a certain extent in Marshes. But when he's kind of been left alone up front to just go be a striker and not perhaps do as much running around, he's been really efficient. He's he's clearly got that little bit of quality. Um but 
yeah, if, if he was to go, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if they try and churn the squad because he's, I think he's 32 now. Um, and he's one, he's actually one of the few players we've, we've signed for the here and now um, since promotion. A lot of it have been, have been punts on kind of future projects or players they hope will increase in value. Rodrigo, I think he was 29 when we signed him, was very much for the here and now. But given the price tag um, and the fact that he was for the here and now, he's not really delivered until until this season, but he does have goals in him. So um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to know which way this one will go in the summer, to be honest. Of course, Patrick Bamford also partners him up front. And uh, Patrick Bamford, I was surprised actually looking at these stats earlier on. Um, 27 games, five goals in those. Um, and of course, he did miss what he should have converted against Leicester as well. Um, is that part of the problem? Yeah, I think so. Um, and this is not necessarily an attack on Bamford himself, but you know, we, we signed Bamford for seven million, rising to nine in the championship. Yeah. And he still is like an attacking linchpin in this side, in the sense that although his, his finishing has always let him down, he's never seemed to be that instinctive a striker. He's had one, you know, one good season really in his time at Leeds. Um, he has never been replaced. They've never sought to, to build on him. And he, and he, he feels like he's a real cornerstone of like when we do press and the defensive structure, like, you know, defending from the front, that whole idea yeah. when he's not in the side we're we're worse for it, but it's finishing as you saw against Leicester. I mean, I, I'm still waking up thinking about that one, you know, in the middle of the night, like, just, just put it. If, if you've seen the angle from behind the goal as well, that a fan caught on a on a phone, it's it's proper head in hand stuff. And I, I do think that's again, it just goes back to recruitment. To be honest, Craig, it's um, it's just they they haven't adequately built on what we had. Like so, we I, we, we signed Jorginho Ruta for thirty thirty five million pounds in the in the January window. He's just he's had zero impact so far, and that's probably part of the problem. Is that if some of the weight had been taken off Bamford's shoulders and we, there was a, a genuine succession plan in place, then um, we wouldn't be relying on him to put those in in the last minute of games against relegation rivals. So, yeah, bigger picture is um, is about recruitment, I think. The midfield seems to be, you know, and of course, you've got Jack Harrison in there, you've got Mark Rocker as well. And those two in particular seem to be the players that will help Leeds get out of this problem. Yeah, in my uh, mind. yeah. Jack Harrison, he, he blows hot and cold as Jack Harrison, which I think is just, again, a symptom of sort of the area we are in the Premier League and possibly his his natural ceiling. But they had a really good game on Tuesday against Leicester. Um, yeah. And he's, he's sort of a solid 7 out of 10 player every week, yeah. most weeks, is, is Jack Harrison. Um, in terms of Mark Rocker, Rocker's got... He kind, of, he kind of he was sold to us on the basis of having a nice pass because we got him from Bayern Munich where he was surrounded by good players. But he seems to be really slow. like, And he, he certainly doesn't seem like he's got the legs to do a full 90 every week. Maybe it's the pace of the Premier League. I don't know. But there was there was a moment, I don't know if you saw the game against Leicester, where I think it was injury time or the last minute or thereabouts. And Leicester broke away and nearly caught him in possession just uh, off the centre circle in our half. And he was the last line of defence. I think it might have been from a corner. And he started sort of doing pirouettes with the ball, trying to turn out of trouble. And he was being closed down by two or three men. And it was just one of those moments where you kind of go, <gasps> you know, you, you let sharp intake of breath and think, oh, please don't yeah. get caught. And he managed to just turn out of it. But he does seem really ponderous on the ball at times. Um, and I do, but I do wonder like if the general state of the, the, the fitness in the squad is maybe, again, we're paying a price for the lack of work done last summer because Marsh came in um, like February last year. It took a long time to recruit coaches for him. So he kind of, it was a make do situation through, through to the summer. But then in the summer, they brought in a guy called Rennie Marich, who was um, one of the previous assistants at Borussia Dortmund. But from, uh, prior to that, he was a tactics blogger. Um, and then um, Cameron Toshak, John Toshak's lad. And then maybe one or two others. Not not a very experienced team at all. And they, they seem to come in late. So you wonder how much chance there was for the tactics to be coached properly, um, improvement of players, but also conditioning as well. And I wonder if maybe they're blowing a little bit after 60, 70 minutes because A, the Premier League's harder, but B, they didn't do enough work last summer to get them super fit, which is a real shame because that's another thing you would have got out of um, Bielsa is he makes your players super fit and they run and run and run until basically they, they throw up. But you will be the fittest team in the league when he's your manager. So it's been a real kind of 
spectacular fall from grace in that respect at Leeds, seeing the players like huffing and puffing after 60 or 70 minutes. And it, and it goes back to what we were saying before about yeah. them dropping deeper and deeper, looking tired as the game wears on. And it'll be interesting to see if that's the form that it takes on Sunday, because I really don't know. To be honest, I think if Leeds do sit back and we do go forwards and, you know, with the pace that we're showing at the moment, you know, it could be bad news for Leeds. You know, and personally, I think if Leeds do come at us, I think you will get a lot more joy. Our back yeah. line, again, isn't particularly very strong. Um, we have the joint worst goal difference in the whole league um, and conceded a hat full of goals, to be fair. Um, West Ham scored four against us last time round. But how do you feel that you cope with Bournemouth, especially in that midfield area, which is our real strength? The likes of Lerma, Billing, Lewis Cook as well. Joe Rothwell's been excellent. And also the wide men. I can only imagine that Atara's going to um, come in because I believe Marcus Tavernier is out for the season. But how do you cope with those players in the midfield? Well, the question is, how many do you play in midfield? Because we've been playing this sort of 4-4-2 four, 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 to all intents and purposes. It is, and yeah. the wingers like tucking inside. So at times we've got four in midfield, but often we're finding that we've got two players um, in the middle, which has been Rocker and McKenney. Um, so I think we we often get caught maybe three on two in the middle. If we're in the four, we look relatively solid. But this is how this is how you catch leads is getting us in transition. So we get our player, you know, our wide players higher up the pitch. So we're left with two in the middle. So if you yeah. if you stuff the midfield, then you might get some joy there. Um, it just depends how how Bournemouth set up tactically and whether you if you play four across midfield, then it might be a, an even match. But if it's three against two, then it could be uh, could be trouble for us. We did play three at the back last right. night as well. So I can only imagine that he'll probably go with a similar sort of formation to that. And if that is the case, do you feel that Leeds have got enough there to actually stop Bournemouth? I mean, potentially. I think it feels to me like, and it goes back to what we were saying before about yeah. if you try and sit back and, and contain stuff in this division, I think you invariably get punished. Yeah. If Leeds are prepared to a certain extent to take this to Bournemouth, then that's I think that's, that feels like our best route towards three points on Sunday and possible survival is we're going to have to go out there and get something. It'll obviously be different against Man City and, and Newcastle, but this it is an opportunity. And um, I think what Leeds fans want to see from Javi Gracia is more front foot football. We're going to have to go out there and try and win a game um, at, at some point. And th this seems like the most obvious one, if only because we, we desperately need to. I mean, one of the big... And one of the big problems that there has been is that, you know, we've, we've got Willie Nonto who plays like on the left, um, attacking yeah. on the left. Um, and and he, he's right footed. So he tends to, to cut in from the left. He's been hugely effective over the course of the season, caused all sorts of problems for a number of teams, you know, uh, helped to win us the game at Anfield just before we played you last time. Um, yeah. And he's not featured under Javi Gracia. And it's felt like we've, for, for whatever reason, he's like he's just one of the few players who who copes with the pressure. He offers attacking threat. He seems to just absolutely love playing football, and Gracia has just not made room for him. But Sinistera, uh, who has been playing um, on the left hand side of attack uh, in recent weeks, I think he's now out. He might well be out for the, the rest of the season. He's been good in recent weeks, so Nonto might come in and play there, or it might be Somerville. If Nonto plays, I give us a better chance than if he doesn't. Well, what we'll do is we'll come on in a second to the predictions part. And there's a couple of questions, a couple of parts to that. But before we do that, Dan, um, I'm going to make you full screen. If you can tell everybody where they can find the square ball. Yeah, you can find us um, in uh, on YouTube, in your podcast apps, um, if you want to have a listen. It's very, it is very heavily Leeds biased, so you might not get much out of it if you're a Bournemouth fan. But yeah, just search for the, the square ball YouTube uh, or your podcast app. Excellent stuff. And all the links are below as well. And actually, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are going to say about us this time around, because I, I'm no doubt there is going to be a reaction show afterwards. And uh, yeah, we're quite looking forward to it. We'll be disappointed if you don't pull it apart, actually. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say just to, to explain what the show is, it's called Propaganda. And we, we just yes. look for clip, clips in the football world, um, whatever's happened that week. And it's basically who's had a bad time, who's had a worse time than you have. And let's listen to their misery. So, you know, we enjoyed... Um, Spurs getting absolutely hammered at Newcastle that you know that kind of thing 
a lot of joy out of Chelsea's fans at the minute. Um, so it depends which way this one goes. If Leeds lose, we tend just to ignore, <laughs> to ignore that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but we, sh- we should say as well, we're just poking fun at it about the, you know, the madness and the condition of, of, of being yeah. football fans. That, you know, the, the hope that we all put in and that kind of that bargaining that we all get into. We're like, well, OK, we've, we've gone one down, but we can, we can turn this around. Oh, we're 2-0 t- we're down, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it is, um, it's all just tongue in cheek and we have a good laugh at ourselves as well. It's, uh, it's not just um, lashing out at other people. Uh, predictions then uh, for on, this then. <laughs> weekend's game. So of, it is a six pointer for Leeds. Probably doesn't feel like a six pointer for Bournemouth anymore. How do you reckon this is going to go? Well, I'm I'm glad you're talking this down from a Bournemouth perspective because it fills me with a bit more hope. Because um, I, I do think you're probably safe now. Um, the I don't see. All one, two, three, four of the teams that are above Southampton getting uh, getting that many points. Um, I don't know, honestly. I, I do not know. How this, it depends which Leeds shows up. My my heart says that Leeds kind of bottomed out against Liverpool, and we saw a slight recovery against Leicester. A game we should we possibly should have won as well, up to a point. Is this the one where we we get the the train either goes back on the track, so we completely derail. That's how it feels. I don't know. Yeah. Which means it'll probably end up as a draw. Do you know what? I'm actually swaying towards that, which is going to do Leeds no favours whatsoever, really, isn't it? No, it'd be terrible. So, um, yeah, Hart, Hart says Leeds win. Head, I think, says draw. Sense of panic thinks, oh, God, Bournemouth are going to win. Well, we... We'll find out on Sunday, um, of course, at two o'clock. Strange time for a game. Um, do you like the Sunday games? No, I hate them. I hate particularly yeah. the two o'clock kickoffs as well. I mean, it's obviously a long way for anybody to come, um, you know, to do this journey. Bournemouth to Leeds, Leeds to Bournemouth, whichever way around you want to dress it up. It's just, it always feels flat, doesn't it? It does. Like the, the, the yeah. Sunday, two o'clock, like because it's not. It's different to a Saturday when people can go have you know, pints in town or whatever, and there's that sense of the weekend still being in front of you, whereas. Sunday, you're kind of closing out your weekend. You don't want to make too much of a mess of yourself and, and all that thing. It always just feels that little bit more, but a bit flatter. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not a fan, but what, you know, what can we do when um, we're all chasing these dreadful Premier League millions and billions for the TV money, aren't we? Yeah. Of course, it is a bank holiday. Oh, don't, oh, don't oh, mention God, that yeah. to a certain Bournemouth fan. Yes. Um, <laughs> we won't go there. But <laughs> I was going to say, actually, we, um, it's, it's funny because we played Leicester in 1990 before we played Bournemouth on the bank yeah. holiday weekend down there, obviously the famous game. We we actually played Leicester at home, so it's um, history has repeated itself. But I, I would suggest um, it will be a little bit more orderly on, on Sunday. Yeah, fair enough. Well, the second part of the prediction is the three to go down. Um, what do you reckon, Dan? Who <sighs> do you reckon the three are going to be? It's going to get thrown back in my face, this, isn't it? But again, it's, 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 it's heart and head and... <sighs> I think Southampton are gone. Mm-hmm. Everton looked bad last night, but they looked every bit as bad as we can be. So I suspect my gut instinct says Southampton, Everton and Forest, maybe. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, Forest beat Brighton, didn't they? They they occasionally dig one out. Let's go with that. Because the alternative for me doesn't bear thinking about. So let's go for Southampton, Everton and Forest. No, that's fair enough. And to be honest, that's what I'm actually thinking after the results, even though they did beat Brighton, I think the Forest still, they're not particularly a great team. I think Brighton had a very, very bad night looking at it. So I would go with those three. Um, but let's do, de- well, let, let's look at both options. If you do stay in the Premier League, Javi Gracia, um, I'm guessing you would look to get somebody else in who replaces him. And what what needs to change for next season if you're preparing for the Premier League? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think Grassi is the man to take us forward, to be honest. I did I did up to a point, and I, I said we should even maybe keep him if we go down, but I, I've seen in recent weeks that I think the the negative football, the passive nature of it all, it just will not work in the long term. Yeah. Um, if we stay up, we are getting taken over. Um so it's um, San Francisco 49ers. It's not them who are actually taking us over. Mm-hmm. It's their um, basically investment arm. It's called yeah. uh, 49ers Enterprises. 
uh, which they own, they already own 44 percent of us um they've put together a fund backed by venture capital money and so on and so forth mm-hmm. that will buy out andrea radrazani that will complete on the basis that we stay up if we go down all bets are off not sure um it may continue with the 56 44 split that we've got at the minute between the current the current owners um so it should be, it should potentially be a summer of renewal for Leeds if we if we stay up, which is another thing that's kind of added to the pressure, the sense that there's kind of good things potentially waiting around the corner um, if we do stay up. I, I suspect we will see Leeds just as an organisation sort of try to, to to borrow a phrase from government level up um, and improve things behind the scenes at the club as well because we're very much a championship organisation behind the scenes. You know, despite having a reasonably good capacity and all the rest of it, stadium needs upgrade, stadium needs rebuilding. Um, that's all in the pipeline, but it's all kind of predicated on us staying up. 49ers Enterprises taking over. I think footballing-wise, they'll go for a more ambitious coach. Again, um, Iriola, who is at Rayo Vicano, was one of the targets after they sacked Marsh, but he wasn't prepared to... Because um, there's, a, there's a strange um, rule in Spain about essentially the, the player or the manager has to buy themselves out of their contract, even if their new employer then pays them back. But he wasn't prepared to do that on principle. Um, even though he was said to be interested in the job, which is, you know, fair enough. Um, they looked at Arna Slot as well, who was with um, Feyenoord at the minute, although I suspect he might end up higher up the table, to be honest. But I think that's the sort of coach they've got the the sights set on. And I think it's good. It sounds ambitious. The, the bigger question is is over Victor Orta, our director of football, as I mentioned earlier on, and his his role in recruitment and the fact that trust has basically eroded now from from him and his position. People don't trust him to adequately recruit. So it remains to be seen if the 49ers take over, what they do in terms of like executive management structure. Do they put more people in around him? Do they replace Victor Orta? There's a lot of unknowns, to be honest. So the short answer, which took a long way to get there, is I, I don't <laughs> I don't really know, but we should we yeah. should be better. And you would hope that we wouldn't find ourselves in this predicament again, but that relies on good decision making at boardroom level. <laughs> Of course, I remember, you know, when I was very, very young, the leads of old, um, the likes of Rio Ferdinand, um, Smith, Harry Kuehl, uh, Viduka, um, Yeboa as well. And of course, Cantona was at Leeds as well. I know it's probably unlikely to get back to that level where, of course, you won the last um, Division One title before the Premier League and, of course, the Champions League semi-final as well. But what would be a... What would make Leeds happy, Leeds fans happy, if you achieved with proper backing? It's tough, isn't it? Because like, Leeds fans are often um, singled out as being delusional or entitled or whatever it may be. And But just to sort of explain where that comes from, um, I look back to my, my dad's generation. My dad's in his, in his 70s now. They grew up seeing probably the best football inside in the world at that time, yeah. Don Revy's side in you know the late sixties, early seventies. Didn't win as much as they should, um, but they were just they were outstanding. And then we had the wilderness years in the eighties, but then um, as you know, we obviously got promoted at Bournemouth and then won the league title two years later. So I, when I was in my teenage years, saw us win the league title. And then fast forward into the early two thousands, and we're in the Champions League semi final. So I was in my in my young twenties then at that point. So we've had, we've had this real kind of roller coaster ride. Um, and then obviously there's the League One years that followed that, and now we've yeah. it took us 16 years to get back. So we've kind of had this real sawtooth pattern up and down the divisions across the last you know, 50 years, even. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that if if Leeds fans have delusional expectations, it's only because like my dad saw us be that good. You know, he saw us in the European Cup final, the Champions League final in, in 1975. So I understand why he doesn't particularly enjoy uh, watching Leeds struggling at the, around the basement of the Premier League. So. You know, my frame of reference is seen as be the best team in in the division, and I'm having to get my head around the difficulty of of just staying in the Premier League. It's so competitive. So, I think we're not unrealistic to the extent that I think we just like to have a nice stable season next season. Um, if we stay up, maybe just get into the mid forties points uh, at this time of the season. I mean, I'm looking at like Fulham, who've got you know forty five points, maybe one point five points per game, just something where it's not a monumental struggle because. It's just been so exhausting. Even like the, you, you'll know yourself. Like promotion is stressful, isn't it? You look back yes. on it really, really fondly, but it's stressful in the in the run up to it until you secure it. And then we've had one good season in the Premier League, and then two seasons of of dreadful anxiety. I think we just want a normal season um, at, at some point, and then go from there. Just give us a solid platform where we're not just gurgling around the plug hole every year. But then again, you, you've seen yourself what this division has been like, and the fact that like nine or ten teams have been in the relegation battle. So 
I don't know if I'm being unrealistic there with with the nature of the Premier League. Um, although you see some of the teams that are coming up and you wonder what the division will look like um, next year. So some stability, I think more medium to long term, aiming for the top half. It can be done if you get things right and the stars align. You know, look at Fulham, Brentford, Brighton. But again, it, it relies on good decisions at, at boardroom level, I think. And Leeds have not had enough of those recently. So um, stability first, and then we'll worry about the rest after that. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny, you mentioned about the League One days there as well. Um, you know, horrible, horrible times, I know, for Leeds. Um, I remember there was an FA Cup game, wasn't there, against Histon? Yes. I'm right in thinking, yes, um, where you did actually get beat there. Um, probably, the would you say that was the lowest point? Possibly. We, we lost to Hereford as well at one point, um, mm-hmm. 2-0. There, there have been a few like that. I mean, we've since uh, we've lost to Sutton. Um, mind you, we even lost to Crawley a couple of years back when, when Bielsa was um, yeah. was in charge. So we, we just have a history of doing stupid things in cups, to be perfectly honest. Uh, yeah, there, there have been a number of low points. But, but the League One years were weirdly fun because... It felt like real football again, and I contrast it now to the state of the Premier League. And I'm not, I'm not really enjoying much of the Premier League, to be perfectly honest. Whether it's the, you know, the VAR, the referee, and the, you know, that, that that I know everybody says it, but the 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 leaning of the officials towards the the big six and all that. It's yeah. even daft stuff like the Premier League anthem. Why can't you just play your own songs? Like we've got marching on together as our anthem, and they play it before the you know the team comes out. And it always seems that we have the end cut off because we've got to play this stupid. Premier League anthem, which is all about branding and television exposure, and it's it's not the thing that you fall in love with, is it? Branding, you you fall in love with your no. football team. So, you know, I'm, maybe I'm just making uh, excuses for if we go down for finding a more authentic excuse, yeah, a more authentic <laughs> version of football that I enjoyed more. But um, yeah, it's it's a strange place, is the Premier League, isn't it? You, there's nothing yeah. much to love about it, but the alternative's horrible. Oh well, you know the memories that we've got of all the shot. And <laughs> Blythe Spartans. In fact, we was discussing that the other day. FA Cup game against Blythe Spartans. Never, ever, ever do we want to go back to that level. <laughs> and we got beat by them. Well, that's always the way, isn't it? Those are the ones that you remember most of all. You don't remember the easy victories against uh, non-league sides, do you? No, no, most definitely. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on again. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on. And all the very, very best with the square ball. All the best for the rest of the season, of course, after Sunday. No, and... I just realised your, your prediction that it's going to be Southampton, Everton and Forest means that we're probably going to have to win on Sunday to do that. That is a thing, isn't it? <laughs> a thing. Or you could go and beat Manchester City. Um, I'm sure a lot of Arsenal fans would be quite pleased with that. But um... Well, they're, they're going to have their mind on Real Madrid, you know. Stranger things have, ha- have happened. That is no, very, very true. No, not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> well Dan thank you again and all the very very best for the rest of the season and you know fingers crossed for a fruitful Leeds future yeah well pleasure and um, I do hope that we're speaking next season because it means we have survived yes most definitely most definitely all the very best mate thank you cheers Craig and thank you everybody for joining us on this show please remember to hit the like the subscribe and the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos we do here on up the cherries and all departments please also do check out our previous videos as well where we did celebrate that win against southampton it was a little bit off the cuff it was done last night so yep do go and watch that also do check out our relegation show with harry redknapp is harry getting it right well, it's more to be seen. Um, we also spoke to him about that Spurs win, that 3-2 epic win that Dan mentioned in the show. And also, we did discuss some of the talent that Harry has found and actually grown throughout the years as well. So do please check those out as well. Until the next show, up the cherries, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm.